Welcome to this series of lectures where we will be discussing this amazing human body that we each live in and its ability to heal itself. You see, the human body was designed to heal itself and it will heal itself if you give it the right conditions. Barbara O'Neill is an internationally recognized health educator and speaker who focuses on natural remedies, holistic health, and lifestyle medicine. With decades of experience in the field, she has conducted numerous seminars, workshops, and lectures on topics such as nutrition, detoxification, disease prevention, and the body's natural healing processes. O'Neill is known for advocating plant-based diets, natural treatments, and a balanced lifestyle to improve overall health and well-being. Her teachings often emphasize the importance of understanding how the body functions and how to support it through natural means, empowering individuals to take charge of their health. Barbara has also written several books and articles on natural health, sharing her expertise on various aspects of wellness. While her approaches have gained popularity in natural health circles, she has faced regulatory scrutiny in some regions for certain health claims. Despite this, she remains a prominent figure in the realm of natural healing and alternative medicine. To do that, we need to go down to the cell. You see, we are just a bunch of cells. There are approximately 100 trillion cells in the human body. We have eye cells, we have muscle cells, skin cells, bone cells, brain cells. And to understand how the human body heals itself, we need to go down to the smallest component, which is the cell. Right down in the middle of each cell is the DNA. The DNA is the genetic code. It's inside the nucleus and it's the genetic code that determines whether you or I have blue eyes or brown eyes or brown hair or straight hair or curly hair. Nothing will ever change that. Barbara O'Neill discusses the importance of understanding the cellular level to comprehend how the human body heals itself. She emphasizes that every human body is made up of approximately a hundred trillion cells, and the DNA inside each cell determines our unique traits. The DNA, which is two meters long and contains all the genetic information, is made up of amino acids and polysaccharides. Amino acids come from the protein we consume, while polysaccharides, or many sugars, are found in various foods like grains, legumes, fruits, and vegetables. The minerals in our food are essential for attaching the amino acid and polysaccharide strands to the outside bands of the DNA. Hippocrates, the father of medicine, once said, Let food be your medicine, and medicine be your food. And O'Neill explains that our food indeed plays a significant role in making up our DNA. She expresses concern over the nutrient deficiencies in modern diets, particularly fast food, which could hinder the proper remaking of our DNA. Let's have a look at the DNA. I think we've all seen illustrations of it. 23 chromosomes from our mother. My mother's chromosomes determine I have blue eyes. 23 chromosomes from our father. My father's chromosomes determine that I'm short. That at 61, I still have brown hair. We do it with each other. We do it with our brothers and our sisters and our children and our aunts and our uncles and our grandparents. It's always a fascinating subject to see which line comes through in each person. When you address that DNA and look what it's made up of, the crosswood bands are made up of amino acids. And amino acids, very simply, is a breakdown from the protein that we eat. It's like a veritable library, this DNA. And if you were to put all the information into alphabetical language, it would fill a thousand pages with a thousand uh, books and a thousand letters on each page. That's incredible, isn't it? What about the outward strands? They're made up of polysaccharides. Polysaccharides simply means many sugars. And Basically, polysaccharides is in just about everything that we eat. Our grains, our legumes, our nuts, our seeds, our fruits and vegetables, many sugars. And the substance that glues these amino acid strands to the outside bands of the polysaccharides is minerals. And the food that is the highest in minerals 
is vegetables. And the vegetable that is the highest in minerals is your dark green leafy vegetables. Hippocrates, called the father of medicine, he made a statement that's often quoted. He said, let food be your medicine and medicine be your food. And he did not know about the DNA. He did not know that our very food makes up our DNA. And when I look at some supermarket trolleys, I think, how will their DNA ever remake them properly? Because the very nutrients required to make this DNA are deficient. Are deficient in your foods that are deficient, like all your fast food. But foods that are grown in the ground and eaten very quickly after they've been picked are very high in these basic things. We are constantly being remade and we're being remade according to the DNA. Did you know that our eye cells are remade every one to two days? That's why if people have eye surgery, it's usually day surgery. They heal very, very quickly. The next quickest are the cells that line our gastrointestinal tract. They're remade every three to five days. We've got a new skin every month. Where does the old skin go? That's why we vacuum the floor. That's why we change our clothes and wash them. That's why we change our sheets, because our skin cells are constantly shedding. Barbara discusses the constant renewal of the body and how certain parts of it, such as the gastrointestinal tract, are remade every three to five days. She explains that the body has all the information needed to create new cells, but only the necessary information is activated while the rest is switched off. The new cell is made of amino acids, which are the building blocks of the body, and minerals, which act as the glue. Barbara also mentions that the gastrointestinal tract is an external structure, meaning that anything that enters it is not part of the body, until it gets broken down and absorbed through the lining into the bloodstream. Barbara O'Neill discusses the importance of a healthy gut and how it relates to disease. She explains that the gut lining, which produces new cells every three to five days, plays a crucial role in nutrient absorption. However, if someone has irritable bowel syndrome, IBS, the process of creating new cells is compromised due to missing nutrients, such as amino acids and magnesium. O'Neill then shifts the focus to DNA damage and its potential causes. According to her, research suggests that 92% of DNA damage is caused by mineral deficiency. She argues that even in countries like Australia, where people consume vegetables, the soil is overused and minerals are depleted, leading to mineral deficient produce and ultimately DNA damage. We have new bones about every three months. We have a new liver about every six weeks. So we're constantly being remade. I think it takes approximately two years. After two years, we have a new body. I used to say to people, you gotta look after this body. It's the only one you've got. If your car breaks down, if it starts to rust, it doesn't work anymore, you can get a new car, but you cannot get a new body. Well, I've changed my mind. I've changed my mind upon realizing that this body is constantly being remade and it's being remade according to the genetic code inside every cell of the body. And so all the information that we need is literally switched on and all the other information is switched off. A photocopy is made, it's called RNA. RNA is a photocopy of all the information on how to make a new gastrointestinal tract cell. And it comes down to another part of the cell called ribosome. And ribosome is the little factory where the new cell is, is made. So RNA comes down into ribosome and the new cell starts to be made brick upon brick, the new cell is being made. What are the bricks? The bricks are amino acids. You probably have heard that amino acids is the building blocks of the body, and that is true. What is the glue that glues the amino acids together? It is minerals. Minerals literally glues us together. Minerals are important. Brick upon brick, and out pops a new gastrointestinal tract cell every three to five days. Our gastrointestinal tract lining looks like this. It's called villi. And down here in the valley, the new cell is made. And it takes three to five days for it to travel up 
and then it dies off and gets taken away. The gastrointestinal tract is a very interesting part of our body because it's actually not part of our body. What do I mean by that? It's an external structure. Well, my skin is an external structure and my watch is on my skin. My watch is not part of my skin. But if this watch were to happen to dissolve and then get absorbed through my skin, then my watch becomes part of my body. So in the gastrointestinal tract, it's an external structure. An interesting part about the gastrointestinal tract it is, that, is that it is eight metres long. It's one opening here, it's a hollow tube, and there's the other opening at the other end where the waste comes out. And the lining, specifically in the small intestine, it looks like this. So anything that goes into our gastrointestinal tract is not part of you or me until it gets broken down to tiny structures, which we'll be looking at this week. Then it gets absorbed through this, this lining into the blood because these villi are covered in little capillaries. That's our blood system. So that's what I mean when I say it's an external structure. Anything that goes into your gastrointestinal tract, not part of you or me, till it gets broken down to tiny structures, then gets absorbed into the blood, then it becomes part of you and me. It's a very important part of the gut. Barbara O'Neill discusses the importance of minerals in plant growth and their impact on food flavor and nutritional value. She explains how the overuse of superphosphates in soil kills microorganisms responsible for pulling minerals from the soil, leading to mineral deficient plants. O'Neill also mentions that even people consuming large quantities of fruits and vegetables may still be mineral deficient due to modern farming practices. She emphasizes the importance of growing one's own produce in mineral rich soil and consuming organically grown fruits and vegetables as much as possible. Additionally, she touches on the negative effects of chemicals, including drugs and genetically modified foods, on human health and DNA. So we've got a big question mark here. Why? Why is there damage in the DNA? Today, research is showing that 92% of DNA damage is caused by mineral deficiency. How could Australians be mineral deficient? Australians are even eating cos lettuce today. I say that because 20 years ago, Aussies only ate the white heart of the iceberg lettuce. Jamie Oliver's done a lot for Australian cooking, hasn't he? He's introduced a lot more greens. You see, the greens are the highest source of minerals of any of the vegetable kingdom. What we have to do is have a look at how those vegetables are grown. The soil is used over and over again. Every organic gardener knows that if he grows a crop in his soil, he cannot put another crop in that soil until he replaces all the minerals that the previous crop took out. So what's happening is plants are being grown over and over and over in the same soil. And they're not going too well. So superphosphate's put in the soil. Superphosphate kills the microorganisms in the soil and they are the ones that are responsible for pulling the minerals out of the soil and into the plant. So now the plant's deficient, even though it might look good, didn't taste any good. And all the bugs attack that plant. Notice the plant that the bugs attack, the wheat plant. So the gardener sprays the plant to kill the bugs. Then the, then the then the plants pick too early, then it is stored too long. And then the last few minerals that may have been left in, say, the broccoli, when they're cooked in a saucepan and the person throws the water out, there go the last few minerals. How does that broccoli taste? If you had a blindfold on, you wouldn't even know it was broccoli. Barbara O'Neill discusses various factors that can affect DNA and potentially lead to disease. She begins by explaining how electromagnetic fields from power lines can damage DNA at the cellular level, citing examples of stillborns and deformities in cattle and plants. She warns against building houses or sleeping near electrical towers and electrical equipment due to their potential impact on human DNA. O'Neill also mentions stimulants like sugar, 
caffeine, and tobacco as contributors to DNA damage. She explains how sugar can lead to diabetes by causing frequent fluctuations in blood sugar levels and damaging the pancreas's ability to produce insulin. She also discusses how caffeine interferes with neurotransmitters in the brain and can lead to mental illness in offspring. Lastly, she mentions tobacco and its effect on the defective DNA passed on to children by both parents. One form of chemicals not often seen as such is drug therapy. Drugs never cure disease, they just change the form and location of the disease and I'm referring to their side effects. Now if someone's been on, on say antidepressants or cortisone drugs for many years, I do caution you must not stop them straight away. It's important if you are on any medication to find someone that, who can work with you to show you alternatives and slowly come off them. It can be quite dangerous to stop them outright. Genetically modified foods. Genetically modified foods cause cancer because genetically modified foods are a result of the DNA of two species being spliced together. For instance, the, the DNA of an Atlantic salmon with the DNA of a tomato spliced together in the hope that a tomato will be created that will grow in the snow. But actually they don't usually result in that and there's this huge grey area. They do not know the full effect on human beings but what is known is the substances that are broken down in the body after eating genetically modified foods are not known in the body and have the ability to tamper and even damage our DNA. Electromagnetic field excess. We are electrical people. We have a spark of electricity in every cell. Our nervous system specifically is our electrical system. Electromagnetic field has the ability to tamper or interfere with your electromagnetic field, causing damage at the cellular level, even at the DNA level. The speaker discusses how various factors, including alcohol consumption and emotional stress, can damage the DNA. The speaker mentions the condition fetal alcohol syndrome, which can be caused by parents' alcohol consumption and how damaging alcohol is to the human body and DNA. The speaker then shares an anecdote about a Japanese scientist who discovered that water can be affected by emotions and music, leading to the damaging or preservation of its crystalline structures. The speaker also mentions that humans are mostly water, and that constant exposure to anger and violence can damage cells and DNA. The speaker then shares an example of fungus splicing into the DNA of plants and ants, highlighting the role of microorganisms as the body's cleanup team when cell damage occurs. In humans, they are 10 hertz. That's the electromagnetic field in humans. And that's, um, I think it's 10, 10 revolutions per second. And with huge power lines, you often get a 50 hertz, and it's well known to cause damage at the cellular level. The farmer knows that he cannot let his cattle graze under those huge towers because stillborns will be a result, even um, deformities in the little calves. My children used to like going up to the huge towers. It was about a kilometre away from where we lived when they were little or when they were adolescent. And they would find everlasting daisies with five centres. They would find all this mutation in plant life underneath these big electrical towers. So if these towers have the ability to tamper with the DNA of plants and the DNA of animals, what about the DNA of humans? Absolutely. It was never allowed that houses could be built under those huge towers, but I see in housing states today they're there and they are a contributing factor to damage of the DNA, even to contributing to, to disease in the human body. Be very careful of the room that you're sleeping in. We spend a third of our life in that room. Be careful of any electrical equipment in your room. Don't, don't charge your mobile phone in your bedroom or your iPhone, iPad, iPod, computer, television. If you've got no choice, try and do it way over in the far corner. 
So always address where you're sleeping. Even where the head of your bed is, the wall. Make sure there's not the meter box, the other side of the wall. Barbara O'Neill discusses the crucial roles microorganisms play in both plants and humans. She explains that microorganisms in the soil break down heavy metals and minerals, making them available for plant absorption and protect the plants against harmful microbes. In return, plants provide these microorganisms with half of their energy produced through photosynthesis. O'Neill then draws a parallel between the microorganisms in the soil and those in the human gut. She notes that there are 10 times more microorganisms in the gut than in the rest of the body, and that they play similar roles, breakdown, absorption, and protection. An organic tomato, for instance, can have nine times the iron of a conventionally grown tomato due to the microorganisms in the soil. She concludes by explaining that when we are born, we are exposed to our mother's microorganisms, which form a thick turf lining in our gut. These microorganisms are essential for the breakdown and absorption of food and protection against harmful bacteria. Contrary to popular belief, they are not the enemy, but a vital part of the life force on Earth. Also, stimulants. Stimulants have the ability to tamper with your DNA. And as I go through this, um, you will see what I mean by this. One is sugar. We have 400 diabetics being diagnosed every day in Australia at the moment. That's an epidemic. Sugar was not known on the planet until, sorry, diabetes was not known on the planet until sugar was well established. Hippocrates has no mention of diabetes in his, in his literature. Thank you for watching. If you found this video helpful, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more insights on natural health and healing. Stay connected, stay informed, and take charge of your wellness journey.